well, I kind of knew that this was coming. But uh, once again, I cannot report on any progress being made on the space between us. But I can certainly report on the progress of the company. I think that what has been really powerful for me lately is this incredible realization. And as soon as I consciously realized, consciously made this realization, I remembered that I actually had this epiphany before. I was 21 years old. It was before I'd had kiddos, before I'd had Max. And I had recently moved back to the Pacific Northwest after being gone touring with uh, Escape to the Wind. And so I'd been all over the country, and when I got back, I bought out the small press that had first published my work because I'd seen what corporate publishing was like and I was disgusted, basically. But um, I reached out to some of my friends from high school. My graduating class had only like 12 people in it, so. And I offered some, some full-time jobs. Paid, not like volunteer your time, it's a startup type thing. And I said, you know, look, all I ask is that there's this giant book convention um, that's coming up and I need to make a strong show there, uh, you know, a strong showing of, you know, all of our titles and, you know, this is all like pr traditional publishing back in the day, you know, where you had to have the money to run 5,000 copies and you had to be able to then store those copies and you needed to be able to work with Ingram and all of these massive this worldwide massive size distributors that took 60% of your revenue of that retail price of that book, plus you know there were shipping charges and then there were returns charges. I mean, it, they just nickel and dime you to death, especially if you were a small press. I said, so all I ask is that come with me and your, your proving ground basically is I will fly you across the country. I will pay for your hotel room. I will pay for all your meals and work this convention with me so that we make a good show and then the folks that want to stay on after this convention can stay on and and you'll have this paid position but you know i want to make sure the team is a good team and we all coalesce and we work well together and we understand how much hard work really goes into running a small press and again i know i stress this a lot you guys like in 2017 for our daily vlog i know i mentioned this before and that I have really mixed feelings about self-publishing because unfortunately I feel like a lot of self-publishers never have an editor other than their mom or their significant other look at their work and so the work is really not really up to par in terms of what it should be for publishing. And I'm not talking about typos, okay? I'm talking about the, the quality, the content of the work. Red pencil editing, not blue pencil. So I really wanted to make a point at this convention that you know we weren't like some self-publishing outfit we we were a small press but we were run with traditional values and we had very high quality standards and what i learned by the end of that convention was that a lot of people say that they want a job in the arts but not a lot of people are willing to work for it i think that when someone says i want to be a job I want a job as a painter, you know, painting, paintings, not like painting houses, but I want a job as a painter. They have this like idea that they'll get to like stand in a beautiful sunlit room with wonderful natural lighting and work on a giant canvas for four months and then sell it for $20,000 or $200,000 or whatever it is. Or if you say, I want to be an author or I want to be a filmmaker that it's like this fun and games and you basically farm out everything you can afford to farm out and you never have to learn to do things that make you uncomfortable or that are tedious or you know you don't have to grow you can just basically someone else can step in and do those parts for you and that you'll still be happy with the final product and we've had this experience the last week week and a half where we had eight job openings for game designers 
because you know Blue Forge Group is Blue Forge Press and Blue Forge Gaming, and those two divisions have actually been around since 1989, just functioning under slightly different names. And now, of course, as you guys know, we have Blue Forge Films and Blue Forge Records, which both launched about six years ago. But Blue Forge Gaming is probably one of our strongest divisions because it's just it's been around since 89 and it's always done the same you know tabletop gaming and then it added and by tabletop it's like um not just board games but like role-playing games and um card-based games stuff like that and it's always been this really really strong division that added to our monthly income and and was such a wonderful division to work with so creative and wonderful and so we thought, well, you know, as we're relaunching all the divisions and really showing that Blue Forge Group as a whole can be wonderful, we have space for these, these positions for game designers. Let's bring people in and offer a day of free training and give them a product to design, a game to design, a deck to design. And then seeing how well that deck does and seeing how they market it and how they stand by their product, that'll tell us whether or not to give them like a full open slot of anything they want to do, any kind of game. Kind of like the blank check, right? And a pal of mine suggested, you know, you should give people like little sneak peeks, teasers into what you're going to cover, open calls and job openings that you're going to do. Like about a week or so before you do them, you know, just like get buzz going, get buzz going. You know, your guys is, Hello Mondays, they get like 30 views and that's it. You know, you want hundreds of views. And I'm like, I do? Because I'm filling all the spots I need to fill and I like the actors that I work with and I like the musicians we work with and I love the authors we work with. Do I really want complete strangers out of nowhere? And yeah, we do often get complete strangers out of nowhere that very quickly become very known to me and I feel like I care about them and their work, uh, especially with uh, like the series that we're doing, um, it's photography and essays called Who We Are. Some of these folks are absolutely, I've never met them, I have no mutual friends, never heard of them, they just happened upon the call for submissions through Instagram or Facebook, because you know, everything is so public, because we're trying to be transparent. But I already care about these people, I already know, even from just the, the very, very short couple of months and the very few interactions I've had with folks, which ones of them I'll work with again, which ones of them I'll approach to do their own standalone projects and which ones I would never work with. So I took my pal's advice just to see how it would go and I put out this kind of like teaser that we were gonna have these game design openings. And I, I was surprised. There was a lot of people, a lot of people jumped in. It was like, me, I want this. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, the details are coming out on Monday. Just follow the easy instructions, which were like, send an email, like literally, like send an email and let us know you're interested. And um, and people posted, people tagged friends and all this kind of stuff. And then Hello Monday rolled around and the job opening posted. And one person, one person who had posted original interest actually went, watched the episode, got all the details, followed the instructions, which were to send an email, and actually followed up and got one of the positions. I mean, there's only like only eight positions, and I think now they are all, they're all full, but they're filled with people that were not folks that commented on this original thread. I mean, this was like, this was like dream-making type job, right? Like, you get to step in and have your idea, a, a card-based, 54-card-based game of whatever genre you want, your creation, you get to have that produced. That was right off the bat. You get a full free day of training where we're gonna feed you the whole kit and caboodle, right? And then you get your game produced in stores and you're getting the revenue from it. I mean, you know, like the whole thing. There's no like sneaky evil fine print. No, I'm sorry, the sneaky evil fine print was you had to be able to get yourself there. You had to be able to get yourself to the one day workshop training. And I think what was hard for me about that is that I wasn't even a teenager yet when my mom sat me down and was just she was never really like a tough love mom. She was just a love mom. 
but she sat me down and she said, you know, you really love to write and if you want to make a career as a writer, you have to basically start now. You have to learn to do things that you don't like to do. Because I think what a lot of people don't understand, and actually interestingly enough, I started counting up everybody in 2017 who in writing or verbally told me they were an introvert, implying that I wasn't because I didn't quite understand them. And some of these folks are like really good friends of mine and some of them are just like casual acquaintances. But they, they use this as an, uh, not an excuse because it's a fact, so it's not an excuse, but they use it to explain why they're not comfortable making cold calls or doing marketing or stuff like this or why it's hard, to them, or hard for them. And again, not, not excuses. None of these people were actually whining. But what's so fascinating is that if you ask my mom to describe me when I was a kid, it was painfully shy. Forget about not sending a meal back if something was wrong. If I wanted a refill or I wanted ketchup from the McDonald's count, I would not do it. I would go without. I would, as a little, little, little kid, I would literally wet myself before I would ask where a bathroom was. That's how shy and scared I was of everything. But what overcame my fear, my fear is still there. I mean, it, it's stunning to me. I don't know if it's because I'm not a very big woman, but it is stunning to me how aggressive complete strangers get with me. The other day I was literally waiting because two people were blocking the bread at Walmart. It was a man and a woman. And I, I was just, you know, waiting about like four or five, six feet away, like oh, several carts away. Um, so that I could get my bread and they were having a conversation and the guy saw me out of the corner of his eye and did a double take and just suddenly like spun on me and was like can I help you with something and his wife or lady friend leaned forward and goes she's just waiting for bread she just wants to get some bread and I was like so floored but like that is so common I don't know what it is that I'm just like, I am a magnet for people to blow up at. Um, I know that a lot of you guys were with me during uh, one of our final festival events for the Take 8 when I had said to folks, you know, uh, anything that is against the rules because, you know, views count and likes count, you know, don't worry, uh, the platform, uh, which was YouTube, the platform will stop that. And <clears throat> when we got a message saying, hey, you know, some of this activity is going on on the account, we sent out a message and just said, hey, you know, not saying anybody who's doing this or whatever, but they say this particular approach isn't right, so we need to stop it and let's just stop it. People were like, you said that this wouldn't happen. And it was amazing. There was like these three people that came after me and I'm like, well, right, it, it's not happening. We're stopping it. The, this is the, okay, calm down. No, no, nobody calm down. And it, it's funny because that, that is, I apparently elicit that in people. I am someone that it's, it's good for people to blow up at. Um, and I don't know if that has fed into me being shy or not, or maybe if I had that experience when I was little and I just don't remember it and that's why I was shy, but how I rise above those fears which can be so incredibly crippling and so incredibly all-encompassing and take over your life and tell you what you can and can't do is I wanted to write more than I was afraid like all I wanted to do was write that was it I didn't want to be anything else and I I knew that all of these things that I hate, cold calling people, walking into stores with a copy of a book, and not chain stores who are going to give you a bunch of gobbledygook technical nonsense about why their distributor won't let them get your book. I mean independent stores where you're actually having to have actual conversations with individuals, with people, asking for the manager or the owner, and it's often the person standing in front of you, setting up at uh, bazaars and festivals and conventions with your own table and engaging people as they walk by. Do you know how hard that is? That's really hard. It's not easy for me. And 
telling myself, I have to do these things because I have to justify the hours that I am spending writing and revising and writing again. To me, I had to justify the fact that I'm not working a menial labor job. I have to earn the right to be a storyteller. So these, Brianne is here now, see? <laughs> And it's true, and Brianne knows, you know, and, and it's funny because I think you guys see me do these vlogs and you see me get up and speak and, and uh, I know some of you have seen the spot on MTV and so there's all of these kind of things and people think, well, you know, she's incredibly extroverted and she's incredibly gregarious and loves speaking to people and she can just talk off her cuff, uh, you know, or whatever that phrase is. And that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that I want this that bad. And I don't want anyone else to have to do any of it. I want to do it all myself. Now, yeah, that comes from the fact that I don't have the money to pay someone else to do any of it, any of the rest of it, any of it at all. <laughs> but it's also because I love every part of this because it what, it's what makes the part I love, the part that makes my heart beat, possible. So I have come to love even the tedious parts like cold calls and dealing with pissy people in email that don't deserve my time but have to have my time or dealing with investors that think that their money can buy my literal affection. I have learned to love those things because they make my dream possible. So that was the realization that I came to for the second time in my life this last week is that you can offer someone a job in the arts. You can offer someone their dream job. The job they've been complaining on Facebook that they'll never have because no one will ever give it to them. Mm -hmm. And those people, there are a lot of people that are simply not ready to do what it takes to make their dreams a reality because it takes a lot of freaking hard work a lot of hard work and quite literal blood, sweat, and tears. And I mean, it's like, you know what I'm saying, you guys? I think you do. I mean, the, the construction and the prop building and the doing without and the living on ramen and the falling off ladders and the pushing cars up and down embankments and trying to get just the right shot or whatever it is. Getting paint dripped down your favorite jacket. Right. Having your, yeah, and just, yeah, like that is such a perfect example. Like you guys, I mean, I it know. It seems so small, but. It seems like so small, but it's like we had this running thing, you know, I didn't have a winter jacket. I didn't have a winter jacket. Every time I came to my mom's house, you know, and, and we'd just be like, no, no, I'm fine. You know, the house here is so warm and nah, nah, nah. Yeah, well, we didn't have money for a winter jacket. Winter jacket money goes to the children. You know, they're both immune compromised. They get the jackets. And my mom went to Goodwill one day and got like this polyester knockoff bomber jacket and gave it to me. It was like seven bucks. And I freaking love that thing. I look, I feel like Amelia Earhart, but like before she disappeared. <laughs> I'd hope so. Yeah. And I love it. And so like it's freezing cold and I have to go out because some construction crud has happened and I have to go in and patch it up or go out and patch it up because it was exterior and it starts to rain and I'm like it's freezing cold but this is the warmest day this week and it's the only week that all this will set up and I go out there and the wind changes and the temperature changes and the paint won't even set and the base won't even set and it starts dripping down the back of my jacket this bird poop white paint <laughs> is dripping down the back of my cheap thrift store jacket that I love so much and that keeps me so warm but like that is what this life is and it's people getting mad at me and trying you no know, and taking advantage of me and screaming and shouting and corporate interests screwing us over it's all of those things but it's also being able to write stories for a living and never 
having had a boss. So it is work. And that was an important realization, I think, for me to come to again, is that not everyone is ready for that. Not everyone is ready to, wow, to make their own dream a reality. So that was really cool and that was really powerful. And I'm really glad I got to share it with you guys today in Somewhere Today. And I think I should drag Brienne with me for my next one. What do you guys think? Bring her with. She's really nice. She's going to be doing her own series. That's why she's not here in Somewhere Today, you guys. You should look for it. <laughs> Can I tell them the name of your series? Sure. It's called Avocado Toast. And some of you will get that joke right away. But it's going to be amazing. Really amazing. She has a mascot. Makes me sick. You so perfect. Mascot for I made a mascot for her. I tricked it out, but I mean, you. Yeah, you about. totally tricked it out. You're so crafty. <laughs> you put the pin in Pinterest. <laughs> oh my god. That was good. No, that was good. That was she thinks it was. It was good. I'll see you guys next rotation. Bye, guys.